Thank you. All right. If you have your Bibles, which you should, don't go to battle without your sword. Open up to Luke. Chapter 19. Now, how many of you did your homework? Woo! All right. I want you to know that some of the things I'm going to share, you probably didn't get in your homework. And that's okay. The whole point of the homework was to get you in the Word. All right? That, that's one of the things that is my drive, is not just to uh, glance over the Word. I want to dig deep into the Word. I want you to dig deep into the Word. Um, so last week we read uh, chapter 19, verses 11 through 27. I'm going to go ahead and read those again. And then you guys were supposed to look into it and kind of see what was going on in this parable. Now, to, to lay some background, uh, Jesus is going up to Jerusalem. He's stopped in Jericho. And he has um, met Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus, the wee little man? And he's, he's wrapped up Zacchaeus, the, the ministry to Zacchaeus by saying, you know, today salvation has come to this house, Zacchaeus' house, since he also is the son of Abraham. Uh, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Um, you know, that's kind of tough when a person refuses to acknowledge their loss. Men, I'm not lost. I just haven't found my way in. I know right where I'm at. <clears throat> and and I, I, I confess, I am the worst person, and it's always Christy's fault, because she talks. And when she talks, my brain disengages from where I'm going and engages in what she's saying, and she'll go, didn't you want to turn there? <laughs> yep. And that happens frequently. We get to the end of our block, and I, I got a 50-50 shot. I'm going either left or right. I miss half the time. Clay, don't you want to go right? <coughs> yes, I do. <laughs> now, as he wraps up this at Zacchaeus, he's telling this, this parable. Okay? So we understand that Zacchaeus is there. We understand that the disciples were there. How many disciples? How many disciples were there? Oh, come on, you cowards. <laughs> at least 12. We don't really know how many there were. Because we know there were more than just 12 that he designated apostles that followed him everywhere he went. We know that were, there were a number of women that followed them and took care of their, their needs. We know there were at least two other men that were there in all of his ministry. So we don't know exactly how many people there were, but we know that there was a gathering. Okay? So we're picking up chapter 19, verse 11. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then returned. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit, and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put the money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who had ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, 
He has ten minors. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has shall be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. <coughs> okay. So in order to look at this, we need to first de define some parameters. The first is the cast of characters. Okay, so Jesus is telling a parable. He spoke in parables so that it would be easily understood by those who were hearing and not understood by those who were just listening. And you know what the difference is, right? <coughs> you understand? Um, like when we're driving and I'm actually paying attention to where I'm going, I may be listening to Christy, but I'm not hearing her. And that's how she gets away with a lot of things. <laughs> we have a rule in our house because I tend to focus on one thing at a time. That if you want to talk to me, you have to wait until my eyes engage with you and I verbally acknowledge what is going on in a comprehensive manner, comprehensible manner. I have to relate to you. I understand what we're talking about. Because a lot of times, we'll have a conversation that I don't know we even had. And I'll walk out and I'll go, what are you doing? And she'll look at me like I just sprouted another head. We just talked about this. What do I say? Did I look at you? Did I look at you? <laughs> okay. But see, it can't just stop there because a lot of times I may be looking at you, but I'm not seeing you. <laughs> and so then what do I say? Did I respond? Did I respond? Okay. <laughs> and I can tell when she knows she's in hot water when she doesn't answer that. <laughs> and she'll like slide a cookie across the table. <laughs> so we need to define the parameters of what's going on here. All right. So who is the nobleman? Jesus. Jesus. Pretty obvious, isn't it? He's, he's talking. He's just talked about the, that he came to seek and save the lost. And then he immediately goes into this parable. And so he's relating to them his place, but he's not just relating to them his place because there's two other party members, groups, in this parable. There's the servants. Who are the servants? Who? Say that a little bit more courageously. Us. Us. The servants are us. Okay? So that would be the believers, the followers, the disciples. But, but then there's another group here that, that you see um, down in verse 14, they're called the citizens. Now notice he separates the servants from the citizens. Okay? So who are the citizens? The unbelievers, the world, those that listened but did not hear. Okay? So we have this cast of, of characters and we have Jesus who starts off as a nobleman and becomes a king. Okay? Then we have the servants that, that represent us. And then we have the citizens that represent them. Okay? Those that are not a part of us. So, before we get into the actual parable, we've got to kind of build up why he's talking about this. You look in verse 11, he says, As they heard these things, those things which he spoke to Zacchaeus, he proceeded to tell them a parable. Why? Why is he telling them a parable? Because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. Okay? So the people that are gathered together with him are expecting that he is going up to Jerusalem to fulfill the earthly kingdom that they believe he was going to establish at that time. Okay? Now, did they have reason to believe this? Yeah, you bet. The Old Testament has numerous prophecies about the coming of the king that will be of the line of David and he will reestablish David's throne forever. Okay? So when, when they're looking forward to this earthly kingdom being established, it's not just something they pulled out of the air. It's something that was prophesied hundreds or even a thousand years before 
And they believe it's coming to pass right now. Okay? So they're all excited, man. They're, they're like, hey, man, we're in Jericho. We're going up to Jerusalem. He's going to be on the throne. I'm going to be at his right hand. You ain't coming. They're excited because they, they believe that this earthly kingdom is going to happen now. Ousting the Romans, Israel will, will once again become the dominant power in their area. God will establish them in peace as he has promised them. But they will have a ruling king of the line and of the, the heritage of David. They're excited. They're pumped. All right? So he tells them this parable. Because, see, they're looking at the scripture and they don't realize. Have you ever been out and, and you see a mountain range and from one perspective you see a mountain and then as you kind of pass by you realize that behind it there's another mountain? Okay? And, and if you have the audacity, you turn and you drive toward the mountain and you realize that there is actually a great valley in between these two mountains. See, the problem was they were looking with very narrow vision at one mountain. The second coming of Jesus Christ. They failed to understand that there were really two mountains, two advents, two comings. Okay? Josh, a couple weeks ago I sent you pictures. If you would, uh, the picture of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Okay? And see, they don't realize at this moment that not only are there two mountains, but that there is a vast area between them. So go ahead and put the, the first one up if you can. I sent him a black slide. Which one? Uh, he should be on the donkey. All right. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Immediately after this, you look at verse 28. We wrapped up in 27. It says in verse 28, And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Okay, when he came to Jerusalem, this is how he came. <coughs> Gentle, riding on a donkey. See, when, when he came the first time, his first advent, he was coming as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So go ahead and put that one up. Okay? This is how he came the first time. That gentle lamb that is going to the cross on our behalf. Okay? They're not looking for a lamb. They're, they're looking for something else. And he's trying to explain to them that, that there's going to be a, a separation between the two advents. Alright? So the, the thing we need to understand is the Jews that are around him at this time, they're looking with an expectation that he's going to take them up into Jerusalem and he's going to come in as the reigning king. And that's not what he's doing. So he shares with them this parable. Now, um, we are coming closer to the end of our series on money. And you're going to ask me, what are we, what are we talking about here? We'll get to that in a minute. But you need to understand what's happening before we get into what he's saying. Okay? Because he knows that the disciples and even the apostles are expecting, hey, you know, within a matter of days, we're going to see this promised kingdom come to pass before our eyes. Okay? So, he's headed up to Jerusalem. He, he stops in Jericho. He enters Zacchaeus' house. Uh, he then proceeds to tell this parable. And each person, he, he calls the servants, which are us, and each servant receives a mite. Now, I, I looked it up and, and there were some hard and fast figures and then there were some estimates and, and essentially what the consensus was is that a mina was the equivalent of about approximately one month's wages. Okay? So, I went online and I looked for 2015, the average wage in Montana was $44,222. That's what they said. I don't know where those people live, but, but that's what they said. All right. So if we divide that, okay, we're going to end up with about $11,000 
that each miner represents. Okay? So he's giving to each of these 10 servants $11,000. Would you be blessed if that happened to you? Okay? Now, but see, there's an expectation that follows this. Because he goes down, he, he calls him in, he gives him each a minor, and then he says something to them. He says, engage in business until I come. So what are they supposed to do? Occupy. What? Say it again. Occupy. Occupy. What are they supposed to do with the money? Put it to work. Okay? Now, he gives him... A, you got to wonder, man. This guy is putting a lot of faith in his servants. A lot of faith because he's taken 11,000-ish and put it into their care. Now, he's done that 10 times. So, these people are, are given a directive to go and, and enter into business. Now, note one of the things that he says is he doesn't tell them what kind of return he wants, does he? But, but he tells them to engage in business. Now, we have a little parenthetical statement right in the middle here, and this is where the, the uh, cast of characters grows. And, and down here in verse 14, it says, But the citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. Now, when you read this, it's, it's very easy um, to kind of get off because people don't hate without a reason, do they? <laughs> yes, they do. All the time. All the time people hate without a reason. Or they hate with poor reasons. Or they hate with reasons that are just completely off base. Okay? And so, this delegation is sent after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. Now, you know, in America, we've grown up under a different type of government system. We do not have a monarchy. As the United States of America, we've never had a monarchy. We've never had rulership pass from parent to child. So, so some of the stuff that is going on here, we really don't grasp because we've not grown up in that culture. But let's make it simple for you. The king rules absolutely. Okay. Whether for good or for bad, he rules absolutely. We have seen through history there have been good kings. We have seen through history there have been bad kings. Okay, So, we have to adjust our thinking to what's going on in this parable. Because we want to look at this as though it were a, a constitutional republic and the people are coming after them as though they had a voice to change what was going to happen and say, hey, we don't want this guy to rule over him. Who do you suppose they're talking to? You see, here's the unseen fourth person in this parable. Who are they taking their complaint to? Hmm? Well, who's going to give him the kingship? Who's going to make him royalty? Who is the only one that can make Jesus king? The Father. So they're sending, can you imagine the audacity of this? Because Jesus, being the Son of God, and being in His very nature God, these people are coming to His Father and saying, we don't want Him. We want nothing to do with Him. Okay? They are setting themselves in opposition, not just to Jesus, but also to the Father and the Father's plan. Alright? So we have this, this little parenthetical statement that's stuck thunk, right in the middle. Hold on to that, because we're going to get to that later. Okay? But keep that in mind. So now we come down. Uh, verse 15. He says, When he returned. You know that Jesus is going to return? Amen. Are you excited that Jesus is going to return? Yes. Oh man. If you cheered for your football team like that, you would get kicked out of the stadium. <laughs> Seriously, folks. This is the Almighty God who is coming back to claim His own, of which you are a part. <coughs> and you can say, I'm excited. Amen. 
Let me show you your excitement. <laughs> Folks, this is a chronic problem in the United States of America, and I am segueing here. When Jesus said he was coming back, it spurred the apostles and the disciples to acts of bravery unparalleled. When he fills you with his spirit, there should be a birth excitement in you that not only do you know the intimacy and the immediacy of God right now, but that at one point in time, soon, he is coming back physically. Put up the other one. The white horse. He's coming back on a white horse. Amen. And he's coming back to claim his own. And he's coming back to throw down those who have rejected and opposed him. And to gather unto himself all of those that are his. He's coming back as a mighty warrior. That second peak that they were looking for, he's coming back as that. And he's coming back and you will get to be on his side. And you will get to sing his praises forever. Why? Because he's worthy. We don't really understand the full grasp of that. But if the most excitement we can muster up is a... <coughs> Amen. It lets me feel like we don't really believe that what we say is really going to happen. Is really going to happen. Okay? Let me try this again. He is coming back soon. Amen. Okay, that's a little better because now don't fake it. Okay, but this should be the excitement that we have. It is absolutely pathetic that we can watch something on TV and muster more excitement. I almost had fingers cut off when the Avalanche won the Stanley Cup in 2001. Because we had a ceiling fan and I jumped out of my chair and I shot my hands up and the... I didn't care. Because the Avs won the Stanley Cup. It was 2.30 in the morning, folks. I stayed up to watch it at 2.30 in the morning. Okay? But if all the excitement I can muster when I'm talking about my king coming back is... Yay. Really? Really? I've seen people muster significantly more excitement over warm chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> not that those are not exciting. But comparatively, they really don't have the same power, the same awe, oh, the same anything. I don't think he's coming back with chocolate chips, but that'll be at the feast. <laughs> All right? So, now, go to the last picture, please. You see, the first one, he came as the, lo the lamb. <clears throat> now he's coming as the lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's coming with authority and he's coming to make things right. Now, we're in the middle of our parable and he has just returned. See, Jesus is, is seeing the, the, the two peaks and he's aware of the gap between them, but he's already looking forward to that point. Do you know that Jesus is looking forward with excitement to coming back? He's not up in head going, oh, like, oh man, it's so soon. Can't we put another millennia? I'm not ready. You know, I've had a busy afterlife, resurrected life, and there's things to do, and, and there are things to do, because what's he doing right now? Preparing a place. He's preparing a place for us, but what else is he doing? He's interceding on our behalf for all the stupid things we do. Amen. Okay? So he is looking with excitement to coming back. He's pumped. He's stoked. You know, when the Super Bowl and the, the players come running on the field, he's going to put that to shame. Because he's going to be coming down out of heaven. And all of his saints are going to be with him. And he's coming with authority and with power. And he is going to be glorified. Okay? So, back here. Verse 15. says, when he returned, because he will return. Having received the kingdom, who did he receive it from? The Father. He ordered these servants to whom he had given money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. 
We call this an accounting. He's calling them to give an account. What were they supposed to be doing while he was gone? They're supposed to be doing business. Whose business? His business. Okay? So, when he comes back, he has a more than reasonable expectation that something happened, right? Okay? So, the first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. So this guy right here has just paid back everything that he gave to all ten of them. That's a shrewd businessman. Okay? That's a shrewd businessman. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. See, that's what I want to hear him say about me. Well done, good sir. Well done. <clears throat> and then he says, Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. <clears throat> now think about this for a minute. Um, he gave him $11,000, and yet he considers it to be a very little. Right? Right? So, I did some looking as to what cities' budgets are. And I, I looked at Missoula. For 2016, their estimated budget was $124 million. Okay, that's Missoula. But Missoula's kind of small, isn't it? I mean, comparatively. So, I went to the biggest city that I know of in the U.S., and that would be New York. And I looked at their budget for 2016 is $78.3 billion dollars. Okay? Now see, this guy took $11,000 and he brought back an additional 10 times 11,000. So what does that come up to? 122,000 plus the original 11 that he had. So 121,000 plus the original 11. So, but then his master who says, okay, yeah, you know what you did? You did good with pocket change. Now I'm going to put you over cities. Okay? So even if it were small cities like Missoula, at $123 million, somebody that's better at math than me can figure out, because I know that it's a thousand percent fold increase-ish just for Missoula. And then you add the other nine cities on top of that, so you're looking at a at 9,000% increase. Okay? And Jesus says, you know, you've been faithful and little, so I'm going to give you the ten cities. So then the second guy comes up. Now, I don't know about you guys. We always think about the first guy and the last guy. But how often do we think about the second guy? Because he was out there for whatever the length of time was, and he took his minor and he made it five. You know, I'm, I'd be like, hey, man, I got he, he got ten. Ooh. But see, he, he comes forward and he says, Master, here is your mind, and I have gathered five more to it. And, and what does the Master say? Look down here. He says, uh, and he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. Now, he doesn't tell us which city he got, whether it was New York or Missoula, but we know that the exponential increase is thousands of percent beyond what he earned. Okay? But now we come to the last man. The last servant. And he says, Lord, here is your mina which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. Why? Why, why, why would we keep it in a handkerchief? What's, what's, what's up with this? He says, uh, because I was afraid of you. Because you are a severe man. Now, I looked up that word severe. 
Uh, so di different translations have different words there. Um, it's from the Greek word austeros, which is where we get our English word austere. Austere means um, of mind and manners, harsh, rough, rigid, severe or strict, uncompromising. Uncompromising. So what he's saying is, Master, I know that you are a man that does not compromise. I know that you are strict. <coughs> now, at this point in the story, this is almost accusatory, isn't it? Yeah, I, I know you're a harsh man. You're severe. You're strict. You're tough. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. Is he calling his master a thief? Oh, so actually what I think he's saying is that his master is in charge of those who do business for him. He's an employer. He's somebody that has servants that do the work. They go out and work the fields. He owns the field. He pays their salary. They go work the field. They gather his crops in for him. He doesn't gather them. He has other things to do. They do, they take care of his business. I mean, this is the whole point of the thing, isn't it? They're supposed to be taking care of his business. Whose money was it? When that guy brought ten times back, whose money was it? The master's. Not, not the servants. So I think what this guy is saying, he's just acknowledging, uh, you're the boss. I mean, you have people that work for you. You have people that do business for you. And I know you're tough. And so the master said to him, I will condemn you with your own words because you knew that I was a severe man. You knew I was uncompromising. You knew that I was the boss. You know that I have people that are working for me and I expect a return on my investment. So why didn't you at least put it in the bank? that I might receive it back with interest. So he, he's taking this man's words and he's saying, okay, this is why you're doing what you're doing. I'm going to accuse you by that which you have given to me. If you really believe this, why didn't you do something? Because he's throwing those words right back in his face. You don't believe this. If you really believe this, man, you would have done at least the safe bet and put it in the bank. So then he says, to those that were standing nearby, he says, take the mina from him. Give it to the one that has ten. Now, did, do you notice something here? It never says that the master took the minas back. Because the, the word that he uses here, the one that has ten, he still has it. And now he has eleven. Okay? And is that fair? He's the king. He makes the rules. He makes the decisions. It's fair if he says it's fair. See, we want things to be equitable. We want things to be just. We want things to be, um, you know, the one that got ten, he should have given each one of his guys one of them, so each of them had at least two. No, that's not what the master's saying. <clears throat> what the master wants is you to do business. He wants you to do the best job you have with what he's given you. Okay? So, this guy has his taken away from him. And he says, hey, but, but Lord, and, and it's like us, hey, but he already has ten. I mean, why, why would he need another? Because he was faithful in the little. Because he was faithful in the little. I tell you that everyone who has, what does, now this, this is kind of a confusing statement here. Let's work our way through this. I tell you that everyone who has, more will be given, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. How can somebody have not and then still have stuff taken away? I think it's best looked at like this. Each of them received a minor. Was the minor theirs? No, it wasn't. But through their hard work and diligence, some of them brought back ten or fivefold increase. Okay? So, even though the mina wasn't theirs, they brought back an increase 
on the master's behalf. But this one guy, he had the money that was given to him that was not, but he gained no increase. And so what he had was taken away because it wasn't his to begin with. Okay? Now, what does the mina represent? Doesn't tell us, does it? Doesn't tell us. I, I, I looked at a bunch of different uh, commentaries on this, what different people thought. Uh, some people said, I, I heard gifts. Uh, I heard salvation. I, I heard everything. I mean, he's given us everything, hasn't he? That's what scripture says. It says, you know, why do we act as though we had something when we received everything from him? Okay, so if it's all his, then, then it all belongs to him. But, but let's, let's take this parable at its root meaning because what none of them really wanted to address was this is about money. Ooh, you went there. Yeah, I went there. Because see, God also gives you money. He gives you the means by which you earn the money. Now, we look at, oh, I work 40 plus hours a week. And I, I got to tell you, some of you guys have tough jobs. But it's God who is your source. I've seen too many times where somebody has worked their, their fair share of hours and came home with nothing because the business went under or something happened. When I, I ran uh, our computer business, there were numerous times where somebody couldn't afford to pay. Well, I did the work. I provided the, the labor, but they didn't have any money to give back. What that taught me was that my clients were not my source. God was my source. And, and it's so easy to fall into this trap of thinking that you did something to earn the money. And that it's your employer or, or the people you work for that are, are paying you. No, scripture is very clear. God is your source. It is through him that you receive. Okay? And if by some happenstance you tend to lose your job, or you change from one job to another, or, or something happens, does that mean God is no longer your source? No, it means that job is not the means whereby He is going to meet your need. It means there's going to be some other means. For a time, that might be the church. It might be some other thing. But God always meets the need of His children. Okay? Always. Eternity first, and then trickling down to the physical to the temple. So, <clears throat> here's what I want to share with you today. <clears throat> Actually, let's, let's work our way to the end. He's taken the mina away. He's given it to uh, the one with ten. He says that uh, the one that has much, more will be given. The one that has nothing, even what he has, will be taken away. But then he says something really interesting at the end. He says, uh, verse 27, But as for these enemies of mine, who are the enemies? The citizens. The, the citizens, the unbelievers. They're the ones who did not want me to reign over them. Bring them here. <clears throat> because in the current era of Jesus as the mushy-gushy Dr. Dr. Spock parent, he's going to pull them up on his lap and he's going to cuddle them, isn't he? It's okay, dear child. I understand. That's not what he says, is it? It's not what he says by a long shot, is it? Look at what he says. This is Jesus speaking, referring to his position in regard to those who did not want him to be their ruler. He says, bring them here and slaughter them before me. But that's, that's not Jesus. That's not the Jesus in the Gospels. It's the Jesus throughout all of Scripture. Let's, let's, let's look at... Uh, see, see the, the problem that we deal with right now is we live in the, what's called the dispensation of grace. Uh, for those of you that don't know, dispensationalism is the teaching that God has moved in specific periods of time, specific dispensations. Okay, and, and in the Old Testament from 
Moses to the coming of Jesus, it was the dispensation of the law. And, and prior to that, the, and, and depending on who you read and where you go, there are anywhere from seven to 11 to uh, who knows how many dispensations. But the one thing that everybody agrees on is that we live in an age of grace right now, whereby God is withholding his wrath, <clears throat> he is keeping it back, that the full measure of those who believe would come in, that the harvest would be complete, okay? As such, there's been this false teaching that has gone around that, that somehow or another God is not just. That somehow or another that He will not be um, indignant. That, that somehow or another He won't hold to account those who, has blas who have blasphemed, who have mocked, who have rejected Him, who have rejected His Son. And that's false. I want to read a, a couple of scriptures for you. Okay? Um, this is how he is described. Just a, a few scriptures. Revelation chapter 19. Don't turn there. Feel free, please, go back and look this up. I challenge you. Look this up. Because this is the revelation of that second coming, what it's going to be like. Revelation 19. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword with which he will strike the nations. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. Now, does that sound like the lamb, or does that sound like the lion? Hebrews 10 says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Uh, it says that our God is a consuming fire. A consuming fire. Now fire can be good, can't it? Cold nights, man, you, you get the fire going, it warms the house, you can cook your food over it, it provides light. But that's not the kind of fire it's talking about here. It's talking about the consuming fire. It's when that fire goes uncontrolled and it consumes that house that gave you protection. It consumes that food that was going to feed you. 1 Corinthians 3 says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of this. See, when he's talking this last verse here, he says, bring them before me. What period of time is this? See, this is the end times. This is the end of the time that we know. This is... Uh, Let's see. Let's, let's look at some of the things that are described at this time. Um, the lion. The separation of the sheep and the goats, Matthew 25. The separating of the wheat and the tares, or the weeds, in Matthew 13. This is the lake of fire, Revelation 20. This is the final accounting. Okay? When the books are opened up and every person is called before him and what they have done is taken into account and measured. Now, Christians, we are going to be held to account but on a different scale because our names are written where? In the book of life. The book of life. That means all of the sins that we did, covered, forgiven, gone, erased, blotted out, paid for. But then there's all that stuff that we did as believers. And, and he's going to weigh that. He's going to hold into account. What did you do with what I gave you? I, I, I gifted you with music abilities. Did you use them for my glory? I, I, I gifted you with uh, the ability to study and understand and comprehend my word. Did you teach? I, I gifted you with the, the heart of an intercessor. Did you get on your knees and pray? And he's going to hold all of those things to account. Now, to us, there's going to be a weighing out and a measuring, and we're going to receive rewards, right? And, and some of us are going to receive little rewards, and some of us are going to receive great rewards. And, and those will be esteemed that, that have great reward. We all get into heaven, but some of us just get in. We have nothing to lay before his feet. We're just there. 
some of us will come in with a billfold and we'll be able to take it out and, and, and give those rewards and, and others will have cart loads and others will have truck loads. But the, the point is we are not measured under the damnation of sin. We are measured under His grace because of the blood that has been applied to us. Okay, But this last part right here, this is the king sitting down on the judgment throne and he's sorting out sheep. Well done. Ghost, I didn't know you. And, and there are going to be many that are going to say, but Lord, Lord, didn't we? And he's going to look at them and say, I never knew you. I, I don't know who you are. You never received my blood. You never called out to me. You had a good act. You had a good persona. Uh, I, man, you got gold stars for church attendance, but I didn't know you. Okay? That's what's going on here. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> Jesus, who came meek and mild as the lamb that led to slaughter. And you, you saw the picture of the lamb. Go ahead and put that back up, would you? The picture of the lamb. Don't that, 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 doesn't that look like cuddly? You know? I mean, I know some of you look at that and see chops. <laughs> I look at that and I see eat stuff. Goat cheese. Goat cheese. <laughs> she sees goat cheese. Okay? But, but he came meek and mild. He did not come in what his natural position was. He came in our place as one of us to pay the price. Okay? When he comes back, he's coming back in his undiminished glory. And he's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he is going to demand an account. See, our God, our Lord Jesus Christ, is a strict, an austere, an uncompromising Lord. There is no compromise. There's no you, you know the little white lie? Oh, that's okay. We'll let you in. That, 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 no, that's sin. It, it's sin. That, thought, that, that, that bad thought that you had about the person that cut you off in traffic? That's sin. And, and those are the things that, that is in our nature to do that His Spirit is trying to work out of us. Now, we're covered in His grace. If you are a believer, you are covered in His grace. That does not give you title to sin. As a matter of fact, the other, it should actually spur you on out of love and devotion to not want to sin. To work to not sin. Okay? But just by having a good day and, and not driving that clown off the road, mm -hmm. not flipping him the bird, not waving your fist as you drove by him, that, that doesn't get you into heaven. It's only through his blood that you get into heaven. And, and then we become the servants. But even as servants, we must give an account to an uncompromising master for what we did with the things that he gave us. Were you faithful? How, how are you doing with your family? You being a good parent? You being a good spouse? Are you, let me go you one better. Are you being a godly parent? And a godly spouse? Husbands? Are you leading your wives? How are you leading your wives? Are you leading them as Christ has led the church? Women, are you supporting your husbands? Are you there for them or are you there against them? Children, are you honoring your parents? See, you see, all of these things matter. We give an account for each of these things. We can't treat any of it lightly. Because He is expecting great things from us. And He's given us much, hasn't He? He's given us everything. He's given us everything. And in that moment when, when uh, you know, I'm frustrated because Christy had a conversation that I don't remember and I just committed myself to something that I don't want to do, He has given me His Spirit and the fruit that is birthed out of His Spirit so that I don't have to act according to my flesh. I don't have to act in anger. I don't have to have a fit. I can choose in that moment to walk according to the Spirit and I can exhibit peace and even joy. See, that's, that's the, the, the fulfillment of what being a Christian is. It's not just a list of do's and don'ts. The do's and don'ts, that's the law. And that can't save anybody. 
but being saved, being filled with His Holy Spirit that regenerates us and, and gives us that voice that says, no, <laughs> stop right here. Don't go there. Just stop. Lift them up in prayer. Lift yourself up in prayer because you need it. Be humble. Even as He was humble. Amen? Amen. 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 We're going to wrap up this next week. Uh, my goal is to be done with money by the end of August. Or uh, August. Too late. August next year? No. October. Okay? So we have one major section left to go. I will have a little bit more I want to say about this. Then we're going to talk about <clears throat> enjoying money. Okay? And that's where we're going to wrap up. So, bow your heads. Father, we bless you and we thank you that you are a generous, loving God. And Father, we confess to you right now that, Father, we have not treated your things properly. Father, that there have been times when we have been frivolous, wasteful, wanton with those things that you have given us. And, and Father, we just repent before you right now. And we ask, Lord God, that you would open our eyes to see how you would have us invest in those things that you've given us. Father, what would bring about a profitable return for those many things that you have blessed us with? And I ask, Lord God, that you would give us a sensitivity to your Spirit's leading, that in that moment we would hear you very clearly say what we should do. We honor you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>